You know, I have been in, in, in practice long enough to have seen rheumatology undergo a revolution. So when I first started working in rheumatology as a young, young doctor, the common sight in outpatients was um, sight of patients in wheelchairs crippled by their rheumatoid arthritis. Today, if you went into a rheumatology clinic, you would almost never see a wheelchair. So that actually is an illustration of the revolution that has taken place in the management of rheumatoid arthritis. So today I think we can say that the great majority of patients that present with early rheumatoid arthritis are treatable so that they will enjoy a, a good quality of life relatively, if not entirely, free of pain and good physical function and able to hold their job and able to function in the family and in social life. So that's been a huge change. And that change has bec become possible because of recognition on how best to treat rheumatoid arthritis. So when we uh, were treating rheumatoid arthritis in the 60s and 70s, the paradigm was that you should never harm the patient with drugs that could be in some way toxic. So basically, you try to treat patients with the simplest, what you regarded as uh, safe drugs. And drugs like gold therapy, which were known to have some effect on progression of the disease in slowing it down, were really not favored because they were difficult to use. And if they led to any side effect, they could be pretty disastrous side effects. So there was this cautionary approach of using symptomatic treatment for patients, which treated the inflammation, but did not treat the underlying tissue destruction. So let me pause for a moment and explain that rheumatoid arthritis is characterized by two simultaneous disease processes. One is inflammation, which leads to pain and swelling and fluid in joints and so on, and difficulty in movement. And the other is destruction of the architecture of the joint, which ultimately leads to mechanical failure of the joint. Now, the two are linked, but the inflammatory symptoms are more immediately controllable. And of course, over time, they fluctuate. So you could, with painkillers and anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin or naproxen or one of these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or corticosteroids, abolish the inflammatory symptoms or control them. But what became apparent was that you weren't in any way controlling the underlying tissue destruction which continued in a trajectory which was specific for a patient. So some progressed very rapidly and some progressed slowly. So this realization that there was this heterogeneity of patient populations and that some of them needed something more than anti-inflammatory drugs or painkillers to actually benefit the longer term outcome of the disease changed the approach to treatment. So by late 1980s, early 1990s, people became very interested in using disease-modifying drugs. And the, the best disease-modifying drug that emerged from clinical trials at, at that time, in the late 80s, was a drug called methotrexate. Now, methotrexate is an anti-cancer drug. And when it's used for cancer, it's used in very high doses. But it had been discovered actually by accident, like most discoveries in, in treatment, that very small doses of methotrexate could actually prove to be disease-modifying, meaning that they slowed the tissue destruction pathway. So methotrexate became part of the clinical practice, as did a drug called sulfacelazine. These were 
two well-validated disease-modifying drugs used in doses which um, prove to be joint protective, but in the long term also proves to be anti-inflammatory as it happened. So when we came on the scene with anti-TNF, the use of these uh, disease-modifying drugs was not optimal. Well, what has happened is that in the last few years even, research has shown that if you treat early with disease-modifying drugs, then you get the best outcome. Not only because you start arresting the underlying disease destruction early, and therefore the cumulative effect is less, but also because the immunology of the disease is simpler early in the disease. So you can reverse pathways be which become more and more complex as the disease becomes established. So the chance of inducing a remission is much more high early in disease with DMARDs, these disease-modifying agents, than later in disease. Well, the discovery of anti-TNF has now fitted into this paradigm. And because of the cost, but also because the simpler drugs actually work very well, the approach now is to treat with methotrexate, either alone or in combination with other affordable de disease-modifying drugs, like sulfacelazine, and maybe combined with very low doses of corticosteroid, and that would control the majority of patients' disease. In the UK, about 15 to 30 percent of patients that attend clinics, which I will remind you isn't the total population of rheumatoid, rheumatoid patients because the very mild end of the, of the spectrum hardly comes to hospitals. They might be treated by the GP alone. So the hospital is already seeing the more severe end of the disease. So we're talking about 30% of the more severe end of the disease that actually needs something more than the conventional affordable DMARDs. And the best option initially proved to be anti-TNF therapy. Well, now the other biologicals are showing more or less equivalent effect. Uh, but because historically anti-TNF was in the clinic long before any of the other biologicals, and clinicians are very familiar with using it and how to use it optimally, I think in most clinics anti-TNF will be the first biologic that's used in combination with methotrexate or another demand. Off-drug remission is very rare in rheumatoid arthritis. It occurs, and when it occurs, there's always a big question as to whether the diagnosis was correct, okay? Because there are, I think, reasons to suspect that by the time what we call the true core disease within this syndrome called rheumatoid arthritis uh, becomes established, that it is almost by definition on a roller coaster, unable to be arrested. It's a bit like a transplant rejection phenomenon. Once you start rejecting a, a transplant, there isn't any good therapy to control it because that process be has become irreversible for reasons that are not very well understood at the present time. And that's the case in rheumatoid arthritis. We do not understand why a core proportion of rheumatoid patients become resistant to all forms of therapy, irrespective of the biological combinations you use. Well, some will respond by changes. You can, you know, it's conventional when a patient's disease becomes uncontrolled to change the drugs, and some will then become under control. But I think in general, a patient who loses control and has severe disease tends to be uncontrollable with all current drugs. So there is a significant challenge left of an unmet need 
in this small proportion of patients. I can't tell you what exactly that proportion is, because I do think it depends on the clinics that these patients attend and the expertise of the doctors looking after them. So there is a factor here, which I might call the human factor. You know, if you went to a, have, you, have a surgical operation, and if it's a complex operation, it is likely that some surgeons will do better than others. The same is true in medicine. Some physicians will do better than others. But let's take it that even in the best regulated circles, there will be patients that are not controlled. And there is it therefore a significant challenge. So what can be done? Well, I think we need to understand the disease pathogenesis better than we do at the present time. And importantly, we need to understand what initiates the disease, because that is the big $64,000 question. We still don't actually know what it is in this critical gene-environmental interaction that we know is essential, that triggers this uncontrollable process. And we are beginning to understand what the genes are, well, actually, there's one major gene, gene, gene locus, which is the HLA-DR locus. But there are also other genes. And in Europeans, or patients of European descent, there are already more than 40 such genes described. So each of them is going to tell us something interesting about molecular pathways that are involved. And they're beginning to be unraveled. But more importantly, we're beginning to understand environmental factors that might be critical. And for example, we now know that smoking is an environmental trigger of rheumatoid arthritis. So it will be predictable that giving up smoking or avoiding smoking in families which carry the genetic susceptibility would be beneficial. And actually, such a study is in progress. In Sweden, where they have populations of well described gen genetic background, they can follow up in large numbers. And it will be interesting to see whether this prediction turns out to be true. I think it very likely will. So, already we have a handle on prevention, which is the best way forward in control of any disease. The other very interesting thing which has emerged in the recent past is that the microbiome, the bugs we live with, which number a thousand times more genes than we possess ourselves, that inhabit our mouth and our gastric tract, skin, lungs, and so forth, are actually very important in regulation of immunity. And there are some early findings that, for example, gum infection with a particular organism that resides in gums might be important in the mechanism that leads to post-translational changes in proteins produced by cells that become antigenic and set off this immune response that is harmful. We are also beginning to understand that the microbiome of the gut um, is different in patients with early rheumatoid arthritis than the normal population. So maybe factors that determine what your microbes are in the gut is important in health, not only in rheumatoid arthritis, but also in inflammatory bowel disease, like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So I think there are now beginning to emerge clues about the best way forward in rheumatoid arthritis uh, research, which is at the level of uh, the initiating event. Now, I also think that there is another area which uh, is important, namely in repair of tissues. So, you know, I, I, I said earlier that rheumatoid arthritis is characterized by progressive damage to joint tissues. Now, actually, the body possesses a huge potential for repair. And at the same time as damage is occurring in rheumatoid patients, we now realize that some repair is also taking place. 
And we need to understand these repair mechanisms and what controls these repair mechanisms. Um, and whether these are endogenous factors or whether there's something missing in the cells that are required for, for repair, so-called regeneration. You know, the interest in regenerative medicine with stem cells, for example, would be a, an illustration of an idea of how you might start to get better repair of tissues or just understanding the molecules that control repair mechanisms that may, that may and I think already exist in the body that can be harnessed to overcome this loss of homeostasis that has taken place in the patient. So just going back to the story of cytokines as to whether more could be uh, done for the patients by uh, manipulating cytokines. I think it's difficult because cytokine are molecules that usually have some key role in maintaining cellular function. And those molecules, those cytokines that are involved in immune function, um, provide a fail-safe mechanism because if you block one of these molecules like TNF and disable part of your host defense mechanism, you're relying on the other cytokines that protect your host defense. So if you disable a second host defense molecule, that's a dangerous thing to do. And people have tried combining two cytokines as an approach. And actually, predictably, it led to more side effects with infections and basically were a no-no area. So the key to this will be whether you can identify a cytokine that has an important function, for example, in repair that is leading to impairment or repair mechanisms. That is possible and conceivable. I can think of some molecules like that, uh, for example, that control mesenchymal cells. And it may be that you either enhance or block those molecules. And I think thereby you might get, with combination of other immunologically orientated cytokines, a very good combination. I think the general concept that combination is the way forward is true for all of medical advances at the moment. It's true in cancer. It's true in practically the treatment of any disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, you name it. And I'll say to you, it's likely that combination therapy will be needed. And I think almost certainly we're going to need combination therapy for controlling rheumatoid arthritis. And I think combination of certain cytokines might, might be a way forward for arresting these more difficult recalcitrant patients.